Um, well, I think the categories matter. Um, I think there is a difference between reformists and revolutionaries, but the problem is that in practical terms today, um, we are all reformists um, in terms of what we can actually do. Um, there was um, an old argument made by Alistair McIntyre, um, who used to be a member of the International Socialist Group in the UK, a Trotskyist group. Um, and um, he basically said that there was a law, a little known law, uh, known as the diminishing returns of socialism, which meant that basically under capitalism there was a pressure for everybody to act somewhat to the right of their uh, nominal beliefs. And therefore the only people who would probably take a radical stance regarding capitalism would actually be revolutionaries. Um, and I think um, in practical terms that often turns out to be the case. Um, um, in, in real terms there's very little in the way of a revolutionary agency that we could activate. So therefore for most of the time uh, what we're doing is trying to um, advocate reforms that will strengthen the agencies that would uh, be capable of being mobilized in the event of a revolutionary situation. Um, I, 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 uh, I think that um, the sociologist uh, Joran Therabon um, had uh, some insight here. He pointed out that really um, being revolutionary or reformist for most of the working class is not a question of ideology or subjectivity. I mean, that's part of it. But the most important question is the context, the circumstance. W whether they are revolutionized or not depends on whether or not they're in a situation which seems to demand a revolution. Um, and that's really the um, the appropriate way to think about it. To me, the, uh, a lot, uh, most of the time, these dichotomies are used in a sectarian and moralizing way. Um, okay. So it seems to me that there's too much of the idea that um, we have to be in charge of everything. If we're an organization, we have to go in and we have to run it. Um, and the, I mean, this is what I meant earlier when I referred to one of the features of the conjuncture being that small groups of potentially unrepresentative people can project influence um, it, because of the sort of um, the, the vacuum where there used to be hegemonic formations. Um, that, to me, um, is both an opportunity um, in as much as something unpredictable could happen, but a problem in as much as groups um, can act in ways which aren't necessarily helpful to the movements that they are involved in. But the important uh, thing is not to believe that you have to be in charge of it, you have to be running it. Um, I think at this stage we need a, a serious amount of humility. Um, all too often, um, I think there's a tendency to set oneself up as the uh, leadership in waiting for a movement that's going to come along and bear you up on its back and p make you very important. I think the important thing um, is that uh, one has to enter these movements with um, a willingness to learn from them um, because we have to assume that all, not all the problems have been solved and they certainly haven't all been solved by us. Um, and um, therefore I think it requires that one enters in a cooperative spirit with uh, other groups that are there. Um, ultimately, if you find yourself in a movement where they're doing something or insisting on something that is well um, to um, the right of where you want to be or is uh, offending your principles in some way, maybe that's not the coalition that you want to be in. But there's an old 60s saying, which I think still holds true, if you're in a coalition in which you're entirely comfortable, then you're not in a coalition. Well, uh, I think for the pre precariat, for a group of people to form a class called the precariat, um, you would need to define their conditions, uh, their principles of their reproduction. How would they reproduce themselves? Um, and I don't see any such principles. I think, in fact, um, uh, one of the uh, better writers about precarity, uh, Loic Wakant, um, has uh, said that a, pre a precariat as a class is an impossibility because as soon as it fights for its 
um, interests, it stops being precarious. As soon as it meets any of its needs, it ceases to be a precarious class. Um, so it's a self-destroying um, class in that sense. Um, I, I think we have a tendency to proliferate classes when what we mean to designate as certain tendencies or social groups. Precarity is a tendency under neoliberalism in, on all sorts of levels. On one level it's a tendency in terms of employment, we are increasingly precariously employed. On another level it's precarity in terms of um, finance because we're increasingly dependent on a financial system that is chaotic and is inherently unstable. Um, I think it's also uh, we are um, experiencing precarity in terms of the whip, the disciplinary whip of the market. So those are um, some of the ways in which precarity affects us, but it affects, I would say, uh, not just one class or one subgroup of people, um, but it starts by affecting the poorest and it works its way up through society. Um, well, um, I mean, the organisation I'm involved in is um, uh, either it's uh, going to be a footnote um, in someone's PhD or it's going to be um, the beginning of something very significant, I don't know, but uh, it's not going to be a party, you know, it's not going to be yet another tiny mass party. It's going to be um, the basis of part of a realigned revolutionary left and we are in discussions with lots of other revolutionary parties to achieve that. Um, more generally, we are looking to form some kind of radical left party um, and the, there's an initiative called Left Unity which um, has gained something like 9,000 signatures in support of it, which would be enough to start a serious radical left party. And we want to form a revolutionary poll within that. Um, this would be a, a belated um, attempt to um, do what's been happening in uh, the rest of Europe for some time now. Um, and finally, um, there's the People's Assemblies. These um, are um, in principle good initiatives, they are attempts to uh, hold assemblies where people can discuss opposition to austerity and what we do about that. Unfortunately the way they've been done at thus far is very top-down and dominated by celebrities um, and you know you go to a, a people's assembly and it's not a democratic conference but it's somewhere you're going to get spoken at for six hours or however many hours um, and hopefully you go away from that enriched um, and feeling like you're part of a movement. No, what we need is um, the democratic inclusion of all the forces that are currently resisting and somehow we need to federate them to bring them together. Um, so, but that's, I mean, the People's Assembly can be, I think, um, pushed in a more democratic direction and so um, that would be a belated attempt to um, form a coherent anti-austerity movement. So that's the left scene as I see it at the moment. Um, the right, um, it's fragmented, but uh, what's noticeable is that they have far more energy than one would expect. Uh, the UK Independence Party drawing most of its support from the lower middle class and from the insecurely affluent um, who you know could lose their money at any moment. Um, they um, are basically um, the, the backbone of a reactionary movement which is very much opposed to the European Union, um, indeed has uh, conspiracy theories about the European Union, you know. Uh, they call it the EUSSR. Um, uh, you know, it's this sort of idea that it's a socialist bloc overriding um, common sense British values and so on. Uh, more generally, they're racist, they're anti-immigrant, uh, um, they're anti-Muslim, um, and they're quite authoritarian socially, although um, the leadership of UKIP is supposedly libertarian um, in a sort of traditional American sense. Um, so um, they have, uh, they're, they're very uh, sort of diverse tendencies and they're not a, a, a secure, uh, coherent block. Um, they could fall apart very quickly, but at the moment they are, they are acting as a reactionary wedge, um, pushing British politics 
much to the right. Um, and that's a problem that we face. And while they're doing this, they are also re-energizing the far right, the Nazis and the fascists, who had until recently been losing steam. Now they are gaining in strength. So that's the right. comment on is the uh, issue with the independent Greeks because that's something that's I mean that leapt out at me when I heard about it um, that strikes me as straightforward opportunism and opportunism in this sense um, in the short term you might be able to get some gain out of doing that in the long term it will undermine the principles and the whole reasons why you're doing what you're doing so um, it's uh, a problem and a betrayal and one of the one of the difficulties is that um, I suspect um, this is coming from a fairly right-wing interpretation of uh, Polanzas and Polanzian state theory. The idea that one must occupy pockets of resistance in the state and activate the uh, subaltern forces within the state. And there's a belief that the independent Greeks represent, you know, um, an oppressed and marginalized group of people who happen to be right-wing. I think that's just a, a, a serious um, a miscalculation um, and it underestimates the extent to which that ideology is a real active force. Um, and also, can I just point out in relation to this, Golden Dawn, when Alexis Tsipras was interviewed about this in Britain, one of the things that he said about the Golden Dawn uh, when asked was, I do not believe that the majority of Greeks or that a significant minority have become racist or that they've become Nazis overnight. This is all about austerity. If we stop austerity, we will stop the Golden Dawn. The problem with that is, of course, is that it underestimates the degree to which the, a very large number of Greek people are racist and to which this racism is an active component in their politics and the reason why they are blaming uh, immigrants and the left and so on for the crisis and why they experience it in that way. And therefore, you cannot simply fight against the right by building anti-austerity alliances. You need anti-racist alliances. You need anti-fascist alliances too. And that says something about how you resist austerity. To me, forming an alliance with the independent Greeks, uh, which is a capitulation to nationalism, um, and also to an extent bigotry and xenophobia and all sorts, um, that um, is just uh, giving ground uh, to one's opponents. Um, okay, so I think there are a few things. Um, first of all, it's institu institutional um, in the United States um, because there is no um, rival to the Democratic Party in terms of having the left of center vote. And they are ruthless, legally, politically, in every way, in crushing and stamping out any challenge to their monopoly on the left of center vote, and particularly on the black vote. Um, they have used every dirty trick in the book to stop this from becoming the case. So that's a problem. Um, finding a way to cohere sufficient forces to form a third party left wing challenge and to overcome the moral blackmail that says if you do that you'll let the Republicans in. Because the Democrats are quite capable of letting the Republicans in by themselves. Um, so I think that um, that's one part of it. The other part is how to resist this ideological process of taking elements of ra a, a radical oppositional agenda and neutralizing them and incorporate, incorporating them into a centrist uh, political bloc. I think here it's actually a case of working a bit harder when um, the opportunity is there to make the analysis a radical one as opposed to, um, for example, the anti-war movement throughout the 2000s it was, it sounded radical because it talked about oil and greed and corporate, you know, greed for money and so on. 
it was actually anti-Bush. It was not anti-capitalist. Um, it was very much focused on demonizing the Bush uh, himself and the Bush administration. And that meant that when the Democrats got in, you thought, OK, here are these um, sane people. They've got in, and it's going to be a little bit better. And, you know, if it, it, on the one hand, what that does, of course, is it feeds you with false expectations, but it also lowers your sights uh, quite dramatically. Um, so I think um, it, it's, there's no short-term answer to this. Ideology, uh, ideological work is done over the long term. It takes 10 or 20 years to build up a consensus for something. Um, uh, if you take, for example, the um, uh, anti-war movement, um, uh, you know, it basically it's building on the shoulders of work that was done over Vietnam and then over the Central American Solidarity Movement and then the Gulf War. I mean, you know, all of this. So um, that would be my answer. <laughs>
Uh, but I, I mean, I, I assume that we're getting past that. Um, the question is, uh, is austerity going to throw us back? Because one of the logics of austerity is to attack the social wage. And in attacking the social wage, one of the things that politicians are doing is rehabilitating that old gendered project of patriarchy. They're saying, essentially, the best form of social welfare, the best form of social security is the family. We should revive the family. And um, the, the idea that um, if, you, um, uh, if you have needs in terms of looking after your child, uh, you should get the deadbeat dads and bring them back and force them to stay. Never mind that the families are often hideously unhappy and uh, you know, they're, they're destructive and all sorts of things. Um, uh, that's, that's basically the ideology that we're met with here. So um, we're seeing a regression to this kind of privatized servitude and an attempt um, really to, um, and I think it's interesting also that women are disproportionately um, being punished, not with uh, unemployment in this context, um, some, somewhat with underemployment, but especially with low wages, so that the economic dependence is still being created in some way. So um, that's something that we have to um, uh, uh, sort of, you know, the, I mean, it's possible for these things to go back as well as forward, and that's a problem and a possibility that we face. Thank <laughs> you.